Chapter 3 The Vanishing Town The morning came and the early sun went through the window of Tristan's room. Tristan rolled out of bed and packed up all his equipment. He strolled downstairs where he saw his new friend Rigard waiting for him at one of the tables with food already at the table. Hurry up and eat, before it gets cold. Tristan sits down and the two begin to discuss the trip towards Kaelin. Both agreed they would just take the main road since it is about an eight-hour horse ride. They finished their meals and headed out to their horses. The mayor, Silas, and Mary were waiting near their horses to wish them a safe trip and to thank them one last time for helping their small town. It didn't take long for the two to load up their horses and ensure they were fed and watered enough for the ride ahead. As they rode off, they looked back and saw Waylon, Silas, and Mary start to head back to their places and the small town soon disappears in the background. Eight hours later, after traveling through a heavily wooded road, they finally came upon the large city of Kaelin once they cleared the woods. They saw walls that extended past their field of vision and a large gate guarded by armed men wearing silver and gold chainmail armor with a red fleur de lies on their chest armed with spears and long swords at their side. These were soldiers as part of the royal guard. As the two approach the gate, the guards wave them forward. One of the guards proclaims, what is your business here? We are looking for supplies and checking out for work at the local guilds, stated Rigard. The guards wave them forward. As Rigard and Tristan enter the city, they see numerous shops and businesses lining the streets with hundreds of people shopping, carriages pulled by horses, and people traveling the streets. They decide to find an inn with a stable for their horses. They found a place near the center of town called Golden Unicorn. As they arrived at the Golden Unicorn, they stopped by the stable and gave them five irons for a place for their horses to stay. When they walked into the inn, they walked into a large bar to the left. It smelled of alcohol and bad decisions. The hardwood floors were well taken care of for how busy it was. The locals and guests were drinking and listening to a small band playing music on a stage. To their right is a registrar where they can check in and get a room. As they walked towards the registrar, a tall, thin, elderly man with no long silver hair and his blue eyes are sunk deep into his face. Wearing a red jacket that fits comfortably over his long white undershirt. Stands up and asks, How may I help you? In a crackly voice, we would like a room, said Tristan. Well, young man, we have three different types of rooms. The first room is for five irons with one bed. A medium-sided bed with a singular bed for ten irons, and a large room with two beds. I think we will take the room with the two beds for tonight, Tristan said. Rigard looked at Tristan and nodded his head in agreement. The two split the cost of the room and gave the innkeeper fifteen irons and headed up to their room. The two leave their traveling equipment in the room and both decide to go their separate ways to explore the town. They both left and went opposite ways. Rigard walked up to a local and asked for a place that could work on and sell armor. They pointed him down the street. He travels down till he reaches the blacksmith the local was talking about. As he walked in there was a large muscular man wearing a forge apron. The blacksmith stands tall, his wide shoulders and rolled up sleeves show his large arms. The blacksmith noticed the sword Rigard had by his side. Dark Elven Kansan Svot. That is a good weapon you have there. How can I help you? I'm in need of new armor. What I currently have doesn't suffice. Stated Rigard. Follow me. The blacksmith walked him back towards a small room filled with various weapons and armor. I have something that will go well with your sword. T.E. Blacksmith took down a dark elven chainmail. I only have a little over a 1,000 irons on me. Replied Rigard. I have a problem that needs help with you. Give me that 1,000 irons. We can work something out. The blacksmith averred in a deep, low-toned accent. My name is Faustus, and there is a man that has been bothering my daughter. I can't do anything without causing my shop trouble since the man's position in the city. If you could discourage him discreetly, I would appreciate it. Rigard with surprise responds. I can help you out with your problem then. It sounds like a good cause, and I can get some good armor out of it. Faustus tells Rigard. My daughter is working a bar called the Equinox. The man around the time for a midday meal comes to her place of works and harasses her. Rigard got to the Equinox right away and recognized Faustus's daughter right away, a tall woman with long curly red hair and a fair complexion. As he sat down, he was greeted by Faustus's daughter. 
Hello, my name is Marie. What can I get you? Rigged orders. I will have a hot black bean coffee. He settles down in the corner of bar, his favorite place to sit when in a public place. A group of people playing a card game in one corner while in another corner a group of adventurers laugh and tell tales of how they fought some goblins the other day. About an hour later a middle-aged man came in dressed in high guard dress and almost immediately starts harassing Marie. The guy presented himself as a mid-noble of Bolin. This now makes sense why the blacksmith couldn't take care of this issue himself. The mid-noble gropes and grabs Marie, while telling her soon she will give him a night to remember and soon will love him and be another whore in his stead. Rigger gets up and walks in the middle-aged man's direction and discreetly walks up behind the man. I don't think the woman appreciates your actions. I don't give a damn what she likes or doesn't. Now piss off, uttered the man. I would think a hedge-born fob doodle as yourself would know better, snarled Rigger. How dare you insult me? Do you know who I am? The man stands up facing Rigard. Let's walk outside. I need to teach you some manners. Rigard gestures toward the entrance, leading the way out into the dimly lit alley. The mid-noble and his three companions trail after Rigard, gradually encircling him. As the four men reach for their swords, Rigard swiftly draws Storm Weaver with lightning speed. In a single, precise motion, he slices the scabbard from the side of the mid-noble man before his hand can reach the hilt. Rigger then directs the blade toward the man's throat, halting just before making contact. His gaze, deadly serious, pierces through the other three men, freezing them in place. Fear overtakes the mid-noble man's face as the tense standoff unfolds. I am sure a fosterlug such as yourself can understand how to treat a woman. The man pauses and nods his head speechless frozen in fear. I expect men as yourself to hold yourself better in front of a lady. Now leave your swords here on the ground and leave. The men drop their swords. A little reminder to be respectful. With near instantaneous movement Rigard left a two inch cut on his left cheek. The men left quickly leaving their swords behind. Rigard picked up the swords and returned to Faustus's shop letting him know that it had been completed. Faustus, out of gratitude, gave Rigard matching boots and gloves to go with his newly acquired armor. Tristan left the in searching all the shops and guilds. I need someone who can help me with my fire magic, thought Tristan. He walked the various streets of Kaelin passing shop after shop. Magic trinkets, alchemy shops, but nothing that would help him find a decent teacher of magic. He stopped and asked an elderly man on the street if he knew a place that taught magic. The elderly man said there was a shop down two separate allies to the west that taught magic. Tristan followed the directions of the old man and came to a shop called Bob's Magic Shop. A look of confusion and amusement crossed the face of Tristan as he walked into the store. He looked around and it didn't seem like any magic place he had ever seen. The walls and tables were filled with various trinkets and what almost looked like games. A middle-aged man dressed well his hair parted perfectly a snidely mustache with a three-inch sole patch starting in the cleft of his chin. Welcome to Bob's Magic Shop, a place where wonders are found, exclaimed Bob as he pulled out a deck of cards from what seemed nowhere. Pick a card, any card. A look of dismay crossed Tristan's face. Ah, uh, I am looking to learn real magic, said Tristan as he started a small flame in his hand. Bob stated, This is really magic. Just pick a card. Tristan grabs a card from the Queen of Hearts and puts it back on the deck. The entire deck explodes in flames and disappears. Check your pouch. As Tristan opened his pouch, the Queen of Hearts appeared next to his pouch. This magic is that of wonder, entertainment, and amazement. I will teach you these for only 15 irons. You are a good salesman. What you are showing me is interesting. Not what I am looking for but could be useful. Tristan pulls out 15 irons and hands it to Bob. Bob closes the shop and locks the door. Bob spent the next couple of hours teaching Tristan palming techniques, how to hide objects, and many other techniques of sleight of hand. The two laughed and used various objects of different sizes and shapes. Towards the end of their time together, Tristan started getting a pretty good grasp of these sleight of hand techniques he was learning. The time went fast, and it was soon time for Tristan to head back to the inn. 
As Tristan left, Bob stated he had much more he could teach him about magic and he just needed to come back with another 15 irons for a different three-hour class. The two said farewell and Tristan left Bob's magic shop. Tristan started heading back to the inn using the same streets he took to get to the shop as he was heading back. He notices six men in white robes with blood roses, three men on each side of the street. Not these guys again, thought Tristan as he pulled his hood over his head and slid into the crowd of people traveling on the street, quickly making his way past the Order of the Blood Rose members. Tristan soon passed the Blood Rose acolytes and arrived back to the inn and went up to the room, which was empty. This is a time to clean up and get ready for the night. I am sure tomorrow will be busy. Tristan drew a bath and cleaned himself up as he was drying off. Rigard entered the room wearing his newly acquired black armor, gloves, and boots. Wow, where did you get those? Said Tristan. There is a blacksmith and armor shop not too far from here. It cost me all I had and a favor. So tomorrow we will need to find work at the guild. Said Rigard. I am sure we will get something in this big town, replied Tristan. I would like to check out that shop first thing tomorrow. Faustus is a pretty good man. I am sure he will have something for you. The two finished getting ready for bed and slept through the night. The two got up around the same time and packed their gear to go out for the day. Tristan went down and got the two breakfasts before they left for the day. Rigard escorted Tristan to Faustus's shop. When they arrived, Faustus welcomed the two and Rigard let him know that his friend was looking for some new armor also. They walked to the room while Faustus kept his armor. It didn't take long for Tristan to pick out some studded chainmail armor a touch heavier than what Rigard had but still as effective. Where is the guild that most likely has the most work available? Asked Tristan. There is a guild near the center of town. Called the Arrow Tip. It is by the large fountain in the main business area. The two thank Faustus again for his help and head towards the arrow tip. The arrow tip was not hard to find after the directions they were given by Faustus. The two went in the guild and at the entrance of the guild stood a colossal figure, a veritable mountain of a man. Dressed in formidable chain armor with a fur-covered jacket and clad in sleek black leather armor that encased his powerful legs, the guard exuded an imposing presence. Towering at least six feet ten inches, his muscles rippled with an intimidating strength that seemed to defy every inch of his massive frame. What are you here for? We are looking for some employment. Rigard responded. Down that halvete. The large man stated. Rigard and Tristan went down the hallway to a large room where numerous individuals of various sizes and shapes were either sitting at tables or standing. Behind the desk, there stood a slender and frail-looking old man. Donned in a finely crafted purple wizard robe adorned with intricate patterns of stars and moons. His long silver beard flowed gracefully down his chest, and his eyes reflected a wealth of experience and wisdom as he peered out from beneath a furrowed brow. Adventurer's Registrar Rigard and Tristan went to the desk. He needs you to fill out this ledger and I can help you find something. The two put their names, age, and basic information down. Thank you, said the man. Let's see what I have available for two men such as yourselves. The man looked through a couple cards he had and said, He have three things that may interest you too. The first is a missing barra diagonal stolen gem that was stolen from the Order of the Dark, escorting a noble to a town, or find some missing children. Before Rigard could say anything, Tristan said they would take the job looking for the missing slash stolen gem. They were given directions to Temple of the Dark. When they arrived to the, the Temple of the Dark, it stood as a formidable structure, crafted from imposing dark cement that seemed to absorb rather than reflect the light. Its presence loomed over the surroundings, stretching for several blocks in every direction and reaching a towering height of three stories. At each corner, four large pillars rose in solemn support, emphasizing the temple's grandeur. The entrance, though unassuming, featured a small door at the front, providing the only visible access point to the mysterious sanctum within. The temple exuded an air of ominous power, its dark facade leaving an indelible mark on the land. Follow me, the head priest is waiting for you, said the man in a monotone, lifeless way. As they walked down the hall, they noticed on the wall is large writing a list of commandments. 1. You shall trust your God. 2. Do not betray your God or fellow followers. 3. Justice is done according to our God. 4. You will welcome the darkness. 5. Detach yourself from the world. 
6. The world is temporary, the god is forever. The dark priest walked them towards a large chamber. On the way they passed many different members who all had the same dark and bloodstained eyes. The expansive chamber unfolded before them, adorned with opulent darkness. Dark opal-colored rugs, with an unsettling beauty, encircled the room, each one intricately patterned and richly textured. The ominous elegance of the rugs was heightened by the macabre addition of red drops resembling blood, artfully arranged to create a sinister tapestry on the obsidian floor. Columns of obsidian stood sentinel throughout the room, their surfaces gleaming with an unnatural sheen. These pillars of darkness were not mere stone, but held an otherworldly quality. Red rubies adorned them, crafted in the shape of blood drops, casting an eerie crimson glow across the chamber. The play of light and shadow between the dark opal rugs and the ruby-decorated columns created an atmosphere that resonated with an unsettling beauty, invoking a sense of both opulence and foreboding within the grand space. There stood the head priest he stood as a formidable figure, embodying the authority and arcane power that characterized the revered position. Cloaked and flowing, pitch black robes that seemed to absorb and reflect minimal light, the head priest cut a commanding silhouette. The fabric cascaded around him, lending an air of mystery and gravitas. The head priest said, Our crystal has been stolen, and is being held by bandits in a village between Siren Cave and Mountain near the Cressley Notch. When do you need this crystal by? Asked Rigard. Before the third new moon from today, for a ceremony that comes annually. The head priest talking in the same monotone voice. Rigard and Tristan left the temple. That place gives me the creeps. Tristan declared. Definitely. The two got their horses from the stables and started to head towards Cresslin Notch. It didn't take long for them to arrive at their destination. The two stopped behind the cover of trees to see the small village with a short wall around the perimeter. There were two young-looking kids standing on what looked like guard posts and the front gate was open for anyone to enter. Something doesn't seem right. Tristan said. Agreed. Let's just walk in and see what is going on. The two got back on their horses and rode towards the entrance of the village. The adventurers traversed dirt roads flanked by well-kept grass, a testament to the villagers' meticulous care. The children on the watchtower, no older than twelve or thirteen, greeted them with friendly waves as they passed through the gates. In this idyllic setting, the village bustled with activity, filled with women and children, while only a handful of men of combat age were present. The absence of weapons among the villagers, except for the two children on watchtower duty, underscored the peaceful atmosphere. Along the winding paths, scattered houses and a small, one-story and added charm to the landscape. Towards the back center of the village, a communal garden flourished, contributing to the overall tranquility. Continuing their exploration, the adventurers were met by an elderly man with long white hair and beard, leaning on a walking stick. His warm greeting resonated within the serene ambience of the village. As they approached the center of town, they were greeted by an elderly man with long white hair and a beard using a walking stick. Greeting travelers, you must be tired. Please rest and have whatever you need since Eros and Amun provide all we need. Rigard and Tristan get off their horses and two women approach them with water and offer them some. Two kids come up and offer to take care of their horses. Rigard and Tristan look at each other in confusion and wonder. As the old man approaches them and greets them with, May peace and love be with you all. The two notice a shrine in the back of village with a large diamond crystal on a pedestal. Thank you for your hospitality. You have a nice village here. Acknowledged Rigard. It's thanks to Eros and Amun, they gave us the crystal so our village would flourish, and we could spread the word of their love for all. We are not going to stay long. Is there anything we can give you for the water and food? Tristan asked. The old man laughed and shook his head no. I think we actually should be on our way back to the inn before it gets dark. Stated Rigard. The old man pleads for them to stay but the two refused and quickly mounted their horses and rode out of the small village. Rigard, I am not stealing from an old man and a bunch of women and children no matter how much we were going to get. As they got about twenty feet from the village the two looked back and the village disappeared. Perplexed, the two adventurers retraced their steps, only to find that the village, once visible just moments ago, had vanished without a trace. No remnants of the settlement remained, as if it had never existed. 
Puzzled, they exchanged glances, their surroundings now devoid of any signs of the village's presence. What is going on? Tristan said Rigard gave Tristan a look of bewilderment. No idea. Let's just tell the Dark that they were never here. And as the two headed back to town, they felt their money sack get slightly heavier.